cause my hair. No, I can't. <laughs> okay. Um, so on the homework, do you mean like a two representation? <laughs> is it like a two component vector? So like a one 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 zero. Yeah, two D is a two component vector. And then so for the one D, what is it like a scale? One component vector. Okay. Yep, that's what I mean. I strongly encourage you to work together on the homework. That does not mean have one person work it out and then copy it. But it's always a very good idea if you do figure it out to explain it to someone else. Because I had a couple of people in my office hours yesterday who I think once they saw what was happening, they were like, oh yeah, okay, this makes sense and it would be very good for them to explain it to someone else. But So I, I encourage you to work together. But like I said, you're going to take the quizzes on your own. So it doesn't do you any good to copy. Yes? Can you... Can you isomorphically map the integral zero to two pi? To is this a is this a fun question? No fun questions. Fun questions are for office hours. Because I got to get through the material in the class. I, the tone of your voice is like this is going to be a fun question. I don't want to do fun questions right now because I got too much to get through. And the guy that comes in for the next class is a bulldog. Comes in and he has laser beams coming out of his eyes like he wants me to leave. But, but Matt, you should come and ask me those questions in office hours. In office hours, are you available by appointment as well? Yeah, so uh, uh, who, you can't make any of them? Three to six on Monday, you can't make any of that window? Oh, what is your schedule, though? What about two to three on Monday? No? Man, you got it. Wow. All right. Uh, word. Yeah, oh, 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 yeah, yeah. Maybe I should mention this. Um, unofficially, Unofficially, you if you have questions, you can come and talk to me in the studio from 2 to 4 on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I'm, I'm sorry, 4 to 6. 4 to 6. That's unofficial, and if I have Physics 100 stuff to do, I'm going to do it. Okay, but, but if that's the only time you can talk to me, you can come and talk to me. Don't expect to come and like trap me for two hours. Okay, Robin, of course, doesn't get that advantage because he's teaching the studio. Does that mean I can just talk to you? Yes, you can always talk to me, but um, we just have to be responsible with studio time. I don't want it to become uh, office hours for particle physics. All right, uh, but, but, but by all means, start on the homework, and I will be adding two short questions after today's lecture if I get far enough. That's kind of the idea is to see where I get on Thursday and then maybe add a, a question or two to the homework. So. Hopefully I'll get through everything I want to get through so that I can add those. And they're not anything terrible, so... Uh, all right, uh, no burning questions, so I'm going to be going. So, um, last time we talked uh, a bit about groups, and groups became important because we wanted to systematically, mathematically describe transformations. But our ultimate goal in all of this is to be able to talk about symmetries, therefore construct invariant quantities quantities where if we do a transformation, the thing doesn't change, okay? Now the invariant quantities that we're interested in building will eventually be Lagrangians because we're, we're focusing on dynamical symmetries. Um, and one important thing about a Lagrangian is that um, actually it's the action that's of fundamental significance, not necessarily the Lagrangian. In most cases, it's, you don't really have to distinguish except in topological non-trivial configurations and if you're trying to do some gauge theory of quarter transformations, but nonetheless, in most scenarios that you encounter, you can talk about the Lagrangian or you can talk about the action interchangeably, but the action is a real, I'll just call it the action, the action is a real scalar. Or actually, the word scalar, yeah, I guess I'd call it scalar. Okay, so it's not imaginary, it's not a vector, it doesn't have components, it's basically just a number, okay? And that is, of course, what you get after you integrate a Lagrangian or integrate a Lagrangian <coughs> density with some prescribed boundary conditions. So the invariants that we want to form have to be real numbers. And I'll come back to the significance of that in just a few minutes. Okay, so we've got uh, groups. Groups uh, are a mathematical way of describing transformations. But if we want to describe, if we want to think concretely about groups and transformations, we instead typically think about the objects that those transformations act on. And Marcus is going to remind us what those objects correspond to mathematically. They are what? Objects are elements of uh, representation. Yes, elements of representations of groups. So it turned out to be more significant for physics to think about group representations. Now in the homework, I, there's, there's a high degree of confusion regarding what, rep, what is a representation element and what's a group element. And part of the homework assignment is for you to get that straight. Okay. One way to keep it straight is the column vectors are representation elements and the matrices that act on them are the group transformations. Okay, so uh, just a quick 
note regarding the homework on that. Okay, so um, we have some group G. We might have some representation of the group R. Okay, this might be the square, and then I'm rotating the square by 90 degrees. And then the question is, is how do we build an invariant? Now, um, whoops. if I have a representation, so if I have group G, Um, and a representation R, then the representation R, if I pick some element A on the group G, then the representation R will transform by the action of that element A in an appropriate matrix form associated with the representation R. So when I write an arrow, what I mean is that this is being transformed into the new quantity this. Okay. So for today's lecture, the use of arrows will be as such. Okay. Now, to form an invariant, um, I'm going to, first of all, have to combine R with something else. I've got to combine things that transform in a special way to make something which as a whole doesn't transform. And intuitively, if R transforms like this, to create an invariant, I could combine it with something which transforms in an inverse manner. And that way, that transformation would cancel with its inverse, and we would end up with a, a, an invariant. Okay? So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to systematize that. And in fact, in order to do it, we're going to work um, sort of in, inspired by something you're very familiar with, which is taking a vector, dotting it with another vector. And one way to represent this is maybe v1, v2. W1, W2, and we know, and you're familiar with this, this is in two dimensions, of course, that the combination forms an invariant under a specific set of transformations which typically involve rotations in two dimensions. Okay, so that's the model of how we're going to build invariants. We're going to take two things and combine them, and in fact, it's going to look a lot like this. And then once we sort of combine them in an appropriate way, their combination will be invariant. Okay? So uh, this leads me to introduce that second kind of object. Now it can't be the original object because we need it to transform inversely, right? So we're going to introduce what is called the dual representation. Now the word dual pops up in a lot of advanced physics contexts. Um, and, and also the word duality, and those are typically actually quite unrelated. But uh, here I've got a pretty specific idea of what I mean by dual. Um, but it does at some level carry over to many of the other contexts where you see it, it's particularly in quantum mechanics. But the dual representation R twiddle, okay, so twiddle will correspond to the dual representation, is uh, going to be at some level defined by how I want it to transform. So the dual representation R twiddle. If R transforms by AR, the way that the dual transformation is going to transform is going to look weird at first, but trust me, in just a second you'll see why. It's going to transform with the action of A inverse transpose. Okay? So the statement is if the representation I'm dealing with transforms by the action of A, then the dual representation transforms by the action of A inverse transpose. Right now, it's just a definition. Okay? But let's see what we can get out of that definition. Given the representation R and the dual representation R twiddle, <coughs> then we can form, again, motivated by this expression here, we can form R twiddle transpose R. And my claim is that's an invariant. Okay? Let's see how it's an invariant. If I do the transformation on this quantity, I transform each of these. So first let's transform our twiddle. Our twiddle, our twiddle transforms that way, so I have to be careful because our twiddle gets transposed. So everything after the transformation gets transposed. So our twiddle becomes a inverse transpose R twiddle. Okay, that's the transformation of R twiddle. And then I transform R. So that's just AR. 
Okay? Cool? And now we remember an important trick from linear algebra, wherever the hell you learned about transposes. If I have the product of two things and then I take the transpose, that becomes the, the product of the transposes of each of them in reverse order. Okay? So when I write it, I'm going to write it and, and, and include the content of what I just said. So I transpose each of these separately, but I reverse their order. So this is now our twiddle transpose. This is now A inverse transpose transpose. Okay? And then this, of course, is just AR. All right, but if you transpose transpose, you're basically doing nothing. You're lazy. So this becomes R twiddle transpose A inverse AR. A inverse A is the identity. And so after this transformation, sure enough, the combination R twiddle R comes right back to itself. Notice, R and R twiddle change. All right, but that combination doesn't. It's the same thing here. <coughs> if you do a rotation, the components of vectors change, but the dot product between them does not. Yeah. So you're saying by that you can redefine R and R twiddle, and you can have different things in there, but their product in that sense is always the same yes. for a given set. Okay. Yes. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Is this still a group representation? Yeah, our, our twiddle is a representation of the group as well. But both of them are transposed. They're separate representations. There's a representation and a dual representation. And we're going to talk about how you can get one from the other in just a second. But they are both separately representations of the group. One's just as good as the other. In fact, you could have started with our twiddle as the starting point and then define this thing similarly, and you would still be able to construct an invariant. The invariant quantity is still a representation? Oh, sorry. Well, the invariant quantity itself forms a representation, but what representation is it? It's the invariant or the singlet representation. It doesn't transform. So remember when we were doing the squares? And I said, you know, this is a faithful representation of rotations by 90 degrees because every 90 degree rotation gives you something new. But this is the invariant representation. Because if you rotate by 90 degrees, this looks the same. You could also say this is what is often called the singlet representation. Yeah. Is it like the state that I think of A as like some kind of operator? Like so, sorry, say again? Like an operator acting on R. That's what it looks like, but it's like... It is an, it is an operator acting on R. And in fact, uh, in a matrix representation of this, this would be a matrix operator. <laughs> and in the same way that we can describe rotations by matrices. I'm going to put the matrices in in a minute. For now, I'm, I'm kind of being a, a little bit abstract because I want to write out something that can apply to many, many different contexts. But yeah, A is definitely a, an operator on R. In our cases, since we're talking about vectors as these representation elements, they're always just going to be linear operators that you can represent by matrices. That's not always the case, okay? But for our discussion today, it will be. You guys are like, it's play, I like playing whack-a-mole with you. You know, the, your hands shoot up and i got to squash them down and then hopefully there's a lull and I can get to the next one. It's, it's fun like that. Um, okay, so... Um, So one, one, uh, one caveat um, in this is uh, for complex representations, okay, if I happen to be working with a representation where the elements of the column vector are complex numbers instead of real numbers, then I have to augment this procedure to work with the complex conjugate of the transpose of R twiddle. Because remember, at the end of the day, I want my invariance to be real. All right. And this, of course, no, not sad. <laughs> we typically denote by the cross symbol or the Hermitian conjugate operation. But, and I'll come back to that when we talk about a particular complex group for a few minutes. Okay, so um, in the interest of time, I, I actually have 
on, on, on the lecture notes that will appear online, an example of what this looks like for the case of our square, okay, where we were talking about transformations of this guy, and remember those transformations were represented by four by four matrices, and so I give you an element of R, I write down an element of R twiddle, and then I do a transformation and show explicitly that this, this quantity does not change. Terms get shuffled around, okay, but you're adding them all together, so at the end the, the answer doesn't change. It's not very insightful, and it's going to take too much time to write it on the board, all right? But that's going to be in the lecture notes, so you can see explicit matrix multiplication examples of this. Okay, so now that we know that a dual representation would be useful, okay, then we can ask, all right, um, how do we build the dual? How do we actually create something which transforms like this? You could say, if I know R and R transforms by A, then you can sit and fiddle around until you find something that transforms like this, okay? But it turns out that in the language of groups and representations, there's another piece of information which I can hand you, and if I hand you that piece of information, you can take it and you can automatically create R twiddle from R without having to do any of this soul searching. What would transform like this? I don't know, let's try something. Yeah, that would take a while. But if I give you this piece of information, you can immediately build this, given this, all right? That piece of information is called a metric. So, if we have a metric G, all right, and this is specific to a group that you're working with and a representation that you're working with, okay? So this is all very context specific. But if I hand you a metric G, then you can build R twiddle from R just by applying G. Okay? Now, we will make a connection later on when we talk about space-time symmetries and so forth, but for those of you who know a little bit about GR and who are just chomping into bit about, that's the word metric, I love the word metric. This is analogous, it's actually, it is, what you do when you create that guy by applying that to that. Okay, in GR, we use the metric to raise and lower indices, but when we're raise and lower indices, we take vectors and create dual vectors from them. So in the context of general relativity, the duals are dual vectors, the original representation is vector representations, and the metric just transforms you from the vectors to the duals, and vice versa. You can use the metric, you can use the inverse metric to take this and turn it into that, in the same way that you can take the inverse metric and turn a dual representation back into the original representation. So again, this, this analysis, as general as it is, applies to many, many different contexts. All right, so now, this is what the metric can do for us, but let's take this statement and see what it implies about this thing called the metric. Like, what can we decipher about the metric? So, first of all, if the metric is telling me how to build R twiddle from R, and I know that R twiddle transpose R is an invariant, then I should be able to do a transformation here and see what that implies about G, okay? So let's do that. So R twiddle transpose R is an invariant, but R twiddle I can write as G R, all right. If I have a metric, I can build R twiddle just by acting on R with G. Again, transpose of two things which are multiplied together is the product of the transposes in reverse. So this is R transpose G transpose R. And now I'll hit you with a special property of metrics. They're always symmetric. Okay. Well, if the metric is symmetric, what do I get when I transpose G? I just get back G. Okay? 
Now, so far, I haven't done anything interesting. Yeah? Is this analogous to diagonalizing a matrix in linear algebra by taking, um, there's one operator that you apply on both sides of the transpose? Well, I, I'm actually going to apply the operator in a second. I haven't applied anything yet. I'm just, I'm just filling in definitions now. Okay. Now I'm going to do a transformation. So now, so, so, so far I haven't done any transformation. I've just used this definition and observed that G is, 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 G is the metric, so the transpose is G. Now I'm going to transform by some element of the group. Okay? But notice, this expression doesn't have our twiddles in it anymore. Okay, I'm working with R and G. So if I transform it, this is R. So it transforms this A, R, transpose. Then I have G, and this is R. Okay? Well, again, you're going to get sick of this trick. Transpose of the product of things is the transpose of the separate things in inverse order. And now we see that this is equal to R transpose GR. That's the thing we started with before we did the transformation. If A transpose GA is equal to G. So let me, in words, kind of recap the significance of this. Okay, the, the, the hopefully, you know, I'm not relaxing any constraints and letting functions self-normalize or integrating through a toroidal hyperplane or anything. This is not comp this is just linear algebra. You transpose things, you, you take something and you plug it in for something. Okay, you don't even have to know what these things are to follow most of this. All you got to do is know what that transpose means and realize these are matrices. So, so the details I'm not that worried about. You can follow them given enough time. The significance, though, is important. What this means is if I have some group and some representation and some metric G that's associated with all of this, then I can use that metric G to form an invariant. And the invariant looks like this. Okay, but that G has to transform in a very specific way in order for all that to work out. Now this is based on that R transforms like this. So if I know how R transforms, this story then tells me how G transforms. Okay? Yeah? So does this give us a procedure for finding G? So. Well, okay, so let me, let me go backwards. Hold on, hold on. So in this context, I'm saying if I give you G. Now, you can, you can play that game. This is the game we play in Physics 100 where we have a physics problem and then we just pick several unknowns to give the students and then have them solve for the others. I can pick in this story any number of things to give you and then you can figure out the rest. So I could give you the group A and R and then you could use that to find G, okay? So yes, you could solve this to find the form of G. However, when we do physics, we don't normally do it that way. What we do is we start with some representation R, the metric G, and then we use this to find A. We use it to find the group. And that's the way that I'm going to approach it in the next few examples that I lay out. And the reason why it works that way is because particles, fields, dynamical quantities like momentum and energy, those are all representations of stuff. The things we work with in physics are representations. They're the things you sort of start with, okay? The metric itself is either manifestly obvious from how you're sort of setting up the situation, or sometimes it's not manifestly obvious, but it's the whole point of discovery of something, like you know, relativity. But 
But once you have this, you can work backwards to find what are the transformations which would leave this thing invariant. All right, and so we're going to do that in several examples and look at some very important groups. Yes. So in GR we have different metrics. I feel like in this one we're not going to be looking at different things. We're just going to have like so the the role of the metric in GR is uh, is okay. <laughs> so in GR there is a fundamental difference between how this entire story plays out, and that is the following. And for those of you who don't care about GR, you don't have to pay attention to this. In everything that we're about to talk about, this G is given, it's fixed. In GR, this is a dynamical variable. You have to solve the equations of motion to find G. That is the statement that the geometry is dynamical. Well, I guess the question was more so, like, in this context, are we pretty much sticking with, like, one space? Or are you going to... No, 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 I'm gonna, I'm, you're gonna, I'm gonna show you some examples. Yeah, well, that'll be borne out to examples. The answer to that would be borne out to examples. Uh, for the square example we had yesterday, can, can we use this to back up? So, that, so that's one important <coughs> distinction is, um, I'm actually hard pressed to see how all this plays out for the square example. You can, once you've got the linear representation and matrices, you can do all that. What I have a hard time doing is figuring out the picture you draw. I haven't quite nailed that down yet. So if, if any of you would like to try and tackle that, that'd be great. But I just can't go back and draw the associated squares for R twiddle. So, but, but, but once you've decided to describe the whole square story in terms of vectors and matrices, then you can go back and work out a G, no problem, okay? It's going back and figuring out the shapes that correspond to that, which I have a little bit wrap my head around. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, if, 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 you, if you draw a shape and somehow associate it with a complex number, then how do you draw the complex conjugate of that? <laughs> So you said the observables are the representations? Yeah, so everything, yeah, go ahead. What are the groups that they're? The, the groups are the transformations we do to the observables. So for example, momentum is a vector, right? That's a representation, and then we do rotations on the components of vectors. So we use a transformation, a group element, to transform the vector components. So let me, uh, let me defer questions until we go over a couple of concrete examples because I think that this will help. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to, okay, I'm gonna erase everything here except for that last little statement. And again, my approach, and you, don't worry, you know, if, we, if we can get there, we're gonna see a lot of very familiar stuff at the end of this. So my approach is again based on giving you the metric and a representation and then using that to find the group elements. Okay. So um, consider R uh, includes vectors in 3D. Okay, and I'll be a little bit careful. I'll, I'll, I'll fill out this a little bit more in, in a moment. So I'm going to call, instead of calling them R, I'm just going to call them V, because V is the first letter vector. You just could figure that out. Um, so I'm going to say that V has components V1, V2, V3. And again, like all representations, I'm going to arrange them in a column vector. And then I'm going to accompany that with a metric. And my metric is just going to be the identity. Okay? So in this context, when I write I, I'm just, I'm just talking about a diagonal, a three by three matrix with ones along the diagonal. Okay? So what I would like to do is take that and now extricate from it what are the transformations that I can do such that R transpose GR is invariant. Okay, well we've already said that this condition corresponds to this. So what I'm looking for are elements where A transpose G, okay, that G is the identity
equals i. Okay, all I've done is taken this expression and I've put in my specific choice of metric. Okay. Now the a's in this case are going to be represented by three by three matrices. And I'm going to assume that this is a real vector, so uh, R is a real vectors in 3D, okay? So there's no reason to start looking at complex matrices. So these will be real 3x3 three three matrices. And so this condition on 3x3 three three matrices defines a set of transformations called O3, the orthogonal group. in 3D. Okay. Orthogonal in this context just means that the transpose of something operated on itself gives you back the identity. This is the orthogonality relation. Matrices which satisfy this condition are called orthogonal matrices. Can I find another way to say it? All right, I don't want to beat it to death. All right, now, you look at that for a moment, you might go, whoa, those are rotations, right? <laughs> right? But they're not. Damn. Okay? And investigating why they're not is actually very, very interesting. It's, it's close to rotations, but it's not quite. So investigating why these aren't rotations is a very interesting story that brings in a lot of the elements that we've talked about. So, so now let me pause and talk about rotations in 3D. So rotations in 3D, we know, I mean, we, we've got an intuitive sense of rotations. You know, if I pick Martin up and I flip him around, that's a rotation. You know. And uh, who did I punch in the mouth last time? Uh, Robin. Robin, yeah, if I punch Martin in, uh, Robin in the mouth, uh, then that's not a rotation. So let's stick with rotation <laughs> so nobody gets hurt. Um, okay, so uh, rotations in 3D form a group, and that group has certain properties. And I'm going to write down those properties so that we can revisit some of those words that we looked at. Um, these form a compact, continuous, non-abelian group. Okay, I want to make sure you guys are awake, so... Joe, Howdy. tell me what uh, any one of those three words means. Uh, continuous means there's no discrete values. Yeah, and sure enough, if I pick Martin up and start flipping him around, I can flip him by any angle I want, as small as I want. I don't have to jump from 0 to 5, or 0 to 10. I can go from 0 to epsilon, okay? Then, Matt, pick another word tell me what it means. Yes? Uh, compact means that it's a finite or closed. Uh, so how do we know that it's compact? How do we know that rotations are compact? Uh, it doesn't go from minus infinity to infinity. What does it? Closed bracket. And what does it? The angle. Yeah, right, because you characterize different rotations by angles, and those angles always go from 0 to 2 pi or minus pi to pi, depending on your parameterization of the angles. But they never go from 0 to infinity. Okay. I mean, you technically can, but it's redundant. Okay. And then last but not least, Amanda. You don't get to choose. You just got to tell me what non-abelian means. Uh, they do so great. Right, it's not diagonal, which means that if I do rotations in different orders, then generally I don't get the same thing. Okay, good job. I'm not going to kill you guys with these questions. I just want to make sure you're awake. Okay, so um, what's going to be important in figuring out that this is not the set of rotations is focusing on this word, continuous. Okay? So let me show you how this works. So first of all, in order to understand the difference, I want you to consider the following two operators. 
So since we're talking about rotations, I'm just going to call it R. That way R means rotation, capital R. Okay, so the A's, the elements of the group are going to be these capital R's. They're rotations. So I want to rotate around the x-axis by an angle theta, where I've set up some coordinate system in, in which I'm expressing the components of these vectors. And then you guys are probably reasonably familiar with what the form of this matrix would be. I just have to look for where my minus sign goes. Okay. So if you take this guy and you act on a vector with it, it will essentially rotate that vector around the x-axis. So it only touches the y and z components and leaves the x component unchanged. Okay? This, this is a rotation operator. This is an element of the rotation group, or a linear representation of the rotation group. Okay? But now I want you to consider the following operator. Okay? It's related to what I just wrote, except there's a minus sign all the way down the diagonal. Okay? Now, um, I want to take each of these, and I want to ask, do they satisfy this condition? So if I take Rx transpose, and I then act on Rx with it, what you'll find, and if you could just write down the matrix and, and do that, but I'll spare you the, the work, you get the identity. However, in this case, if I take R prime transpose X and I act on R prime with it, I get what? I get the identity. I know. I tricked you. I said, however. <laughs> you guys are like physics 100 students. I can get them all to change their answer to a clicker question. Just by staring at them. Like, that can't possibly be right. Change your answer. Yeah, I actually get the identity again. Okay, so here's the, important, here's the important conclusion here. If I used this condition to define rotations, then these would both have to be rotations. Okay? But I want to argue that this is not a rotation. Okay, we're going to figure out what it is in a minute, but somehow... I would like to take all of the matrices that satisfy this condition, but get rid of the bad boys. Okay? So how am I going to do that? Well, one thing to observe is that if I take the determinant of this matrix, I get what? I get plus one. Okay, you can take that determinant in your head real quickly. If I take the determinant of this matrix, I get, this time I, I did get a minus sign. You get negative one. Okay? Again, I'm going to come back and tell you what these are in a minute. But just for now, they're not rotations and I would like to get rid of them. Okay? So, if we take this information and we only use R's such that R transpose R equals the identity and debt R equals plus one, then I exclude these, I keep these, and I would argue that that corresponds to a representation of the rotations. Okay. This condition is called the special condition. <coughs> so at the end of the day, imposing both of these gives us SO3, the special orthogonal group in three dimensions. Bam! There it is. I know you've heard of that before. SO3. So what? SO3. OK? So the reason we impose S is specifically to get rid of these things, which I'll argue in a minute should not be in the rotation group. Okay. Just saying O3 doesn't do that for us. Okay. Of course, just imposing S without O3 doesn't really mean anything. So 
Okay, so um, now what's cool is we can use this story to explore some interesting ideas that we encountered when we were talking about groups in the first place. So first of all, this is a group, right? This is a subgroup, or is it? How do we define a subgroup of a group? David Cruz, where are you, David? Um, right there. there, yeah. How do we define a subgroup of a group? Um, all the elements in the subgroup are contained in the group. There, so that's a subset, but if that subset does what, then we call it a subgroup. You can phone a friend. Um, not sure. If that subset forms a group itself. So the question is, do these things form a group? Well, how do we know if something forms a group? We have four criteria, right? Let's check them. Okay. What's the first criteria? Try to go figure out. I'm running out of room. I don't want to raise anything yet. What's the first criteria for a group? Closure. Okay. So if I take two elements of this, then I and I combine them, then I have to get another element of this. Okay. Now, what's tricky about that is if I take two matrices with positive determinant. Am I sure that their combination has a positive determinant? Yes. Yeah. Whoa, yeah, we got to be careful. So if I take, if I, you guys were so excited about that. If I take R1, let me see how I've got this in my example. Um, if I take R1 and R2, okay, and I just call that R12, if each of these have determinant equals to plus one, then am I guaranteed that that has determinant plus one? And the answer is yes. Let's show it. So the determinant of this is the determinant of this. Which is a product of the determinants. But for determinants, if I take the determinant of a product, it's the product of the determinants. So this is debt R. That is not, that's not trivial. I don't remember that kind of thing. It, it's not intuitive, but it's, it's a result from linear algebra. So if you're, if you're like, I didn't remember that. No, don't worry, I don't remember it either. <laughs> the determinant of a product of matrices is the product of the determinants, but each of these is plus one, so the determinant of their combination is plus one, and that's closure. If I take two elements of SO3 and I combine them, I still have an element of SO3. See? Cool. All right? You might notice something. If I were working with determinant minus one, I couldn't do that. Because if I combine two of them, I would then get something with determinant plus one. So you can't take this subset that you threw out and form a group from it. Damn. All right. So um, what's, the, what's another criterion for group? The identity. OK. So the question is, is the identity a part of this set? Well, what's the identity look like? Yeah, it's, it's one, one, one. And last time I checked, the determinant of that was plus one. So yeah, the, the, we have the identity. Yeah. Um, so when you're saying if we included the Rx prime, we wouldn't have, uh, it, it would be like the determinant of R1, or the determinant of R2 would be one. Um, <coughs> is one not in the, the group then? Like, so, okay, so um, when we're saying. Oh, 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 okay, okay, so we have to be careful. So if I'm doing this, then I'm including both of these. Okay. But this does not require the determinant to be plus one. The determinant can be plus one or minus one, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So if I'm just working with this, I could take two things with determinant minus one, combine them, get something with a determinant plus one, and it's okay because I'm still in the group. Okay. What I was saying was if I just tried to work with these by themselves, where everything has determinant minus one and only minus one, that can't form a group. Because if I combine two of them, the combination has to have determinant plus one. OK, I see. <clears throat> you can't form a subgroup from that because you basically have to have the plus one, which is just both. Exactly. Exactly. OK. So the third is inverse. All right, and the properties of inverse. Um, so we have R transpose R equals the identity. We're not going to have a hard time identifying the inverse in this situation. 
R inverse is just R transpose, right? This is actually stating what the inverse is, okay? So the question we can now ask is, if I take an R that's in SO3, is the inverse also in SO3? And another thing to ask is, is its determinant also plus one? Okay, so if the determinant of R is plus one, then the determinant of R transpose, well, you, anybody want to tell me that nice property of? It's also oh, it's the determinant of R. Yeah, it's also, it's the same as the determinant of R, okay? So if I have a matrix and it's, I have, have its determinant, I can transpose the matrix and the determinant is unchanged. All right, so the last condition to check is associativity. And the wonderful thing is, is that whenever we work with matrix representations of groups, we automatically have associativity because matrix multiplication is associative. So you rarely have to check that. So this thing forms a subgroup, which is good because rotations, we would hope form a group because groups are nice, okay? So now the question we might ask is what did we lose here? Okay. And what we lost turns out to be something that's not only interesting for the sake of curiosity, but, but will be very important for this class. So, so essentially, we lost elements that are generically of this form, and I'm going to write this, but there's, you can always tweak it, okay? But we basically lost elements that look like that, which is taking any element from SO3 and then putting minus signs all the way down the diagonal, okay? You can go in and put in, you know, cosines and sines and all that stuff, all right? So, with O3, we kept elements like this, but going to SO3, we threw them out. And the question is, is why did we throw them out? Why do we need to get rid of them? Well, yeah. So do you still lose the set if you mul just multiply scalar negative one in front of everything? That hits everything, not just the diagonal. Yeah, so does that discrete it now from our Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah. If you, if you multiply it by minus one, then you've changed the sign of the determinant. Because if you multiply matrix by a number, the determinant changes by that number. Okay, so yeah, you're right. You're right. So, th this is cool. You're going to like this, I promise. I'm excited. I'm, like, I'm already sweating a lot, but I'm going to sweat more. Okay. Um, what am I doing with this operation? I'm inverting my coordinates. So this takes this coordinate system, and it reverses all three coordinates. So now we're going to have our drawing prowess tested. Okay. And now it's time for you to get geometric. Can you get here from here by rotating? If you have a mirror. Can you take this object, you build this with Tinker Toys, can you take it and rotate it to form that? Can uh, they rotate independent of each other? Say it again? Can like the axes rotate independent of each other? No, no, no. I'm, I, yeah, no, no, no. Rigidly. Can I take this thing and turn it into that it's by a, rotation? It's a left-handed coordinate system. So. Yeah. So this is a left-handed coordinate system. This is a right-handed coordinate system. But just look at the picture. It, so this, this is this. I can't, I can't do it with my hands because my hands don't have X, Y's, and Z's on. You can write X, Y, and Z on your fingers and then rotate your fingers and you'll realize you're never going to create this. The point, people, listen, is this thing does not correspond to a rotation. That's why we threw it out. Now you might say, well, so? Say that. Say so. So? Well, what did I, sh 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 what did I tell you about rotations? They form a continuous group. When you rotate, 
you can rotate to anywhere you want continuously. You can start a little and then keep going and eventually get to where you want to be. You can do this transformation by inverting the coordinates, but you cannot do it continuously. So if you have a group with elements that have determinant plus one and minus one, both in it, does that mean that you automatically have a discontinuous group? Yes. So O3 is not continuous. So I guess what I'm talking about is why are we trying to be continuous? Uh, well, rotations. Yeah, why are we trying to, to be rotations? <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. I'm trying to define rotations okay. for you. I'm not saying that these <laughs> aren't important transformations. I'm just saying right now I want to define what, what rotations are. And this is not a rotation, OK? This is actually a transformation which we call a parity transformation, OK? Now, if you think about it for a moment, you can actually get the same result with that. OK? You could just make one of them negative. So if I start with an x, y, and z, and I just reflect x, that also gives me a left-handed coordinate system. All right? Wait, is that why you called it p? That's why I called it p. <laughs> and we are going to talk about parity later on, OK? Now put your thinking caps on. However, what happens if I do that? It's now fine. Well, what's the determinant of this? It's plus one. Depends on what the other entries are. You can rotate to that coordinate system. Exactly. This is a rotation. If I take a two-dimensional coordinate system and I invert that and only two dimensions, that's a rotation. So it's the inversion of an odd number of coordinates that is truly a parity reflection. Okay, reflection of an even number of coordinates is actually a rotation. And mathematically you can see it because the determinant of it would be plus one. It is part of the rotation group. Yeah? Doesn't that require that two of the um, other elements of the row or column must be zero? Yeah, uh, um, I, 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 so I, I'm, I'm giving you a sketch of what these elements look like. And when you fill it in, you have to make sure that you don't screw up. I mean, you, you have to fill it in with the appropriate sine and cosine angle such that you satisfy this condition in the first place. And so that will take care of all the details. There's a lot of things you could write like this. In fact, if I asked, um, what, are the, what are the elements here? So, so, so in a sense, O3. Sorry, O3 was the original group, SO3 is a subgroup. Is there some way to take SO3 and create the full group O3 with it? And the answer is yes. So what you can do is you can decompose O3 into SO3 cross with something we call, uh, what did I call it? Make sure I call it the right thing so that you understand my notes. Yeah, it's called Z2. Across Z2, where this thing is a group with two elements. All right? It's a group, so it's got to have the identity. But it also has this parity thing. And you can take these two matrices and you can show that they satisfy all the properties of group. Okay? The inverse of this is itself. The inverse of this is itself. The identity exists. It's associated because of matrix multiplication. And if you multiply this times this, you get this. It's in the group. So you have closure, OK? You can take any element of SO3 you want, any, any rotation you want, and if you combine it with this transformation, you stay in the rotations. If you combine it with this transformation, then you get one of these. Yeah? Cross, do you mean the dynamic product? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to get too far into the, the mathy part of this, but this cross just means you take an element of this and you combine it with an element of this, and you can just combine it with matrix multiplication. Okay, I don't, I don't want to spend too much time talking about combinations of groups in that way. Is that um, the Z1? The Z2? Yeah. Z2. <laughs> it, it, it is, it is the, it's the second most trivial discrete group. The most trivial group is the identity. 
and then this is the second most trivial one, and this pops up all over the place. So the idea of even and odd is this. Even times even is even, even times odd is odd, odd times odd is even. It's exactly this, okay? Also addition modulo one. There's, there's lots of different ways uh, to see this group. Okay, so, um, so you know, a lot of this sort of, you know, we're gonna come back and talk about parity, okay, later on. We can argue that rotations are symmetries of the dynamics because, you know, we, we kind of can continuously transform our systems and, and you know, there's, there's sort of manifest rotational invariance. But the question of whether or not parity is a good symmetry is an independent question. Okay, and that's one that we'll talk about in due time. But um, I do want to get on to uh, an example of one more group, and, and then we're going to do a little bit of counting. So let me... And I'm not going to have a discussion in that much detail um, for this group, but I at least want to get it out there. So this time, let me take my vectors and make them complex. And this time we'll just be in 2D so I don't have to write three by three matrices. And then we'll work with again the identity. Now remember a complex vector is just a vector where each element is itself a complex number. So it's A plus IB, where A and B are real. Okay? So when I say a complex vector, that's what I mean components of the vector are complex numbers, okay? Now, again, I have the metric, I have a representation, I can go back and ask what are the A's? Well, the A's have to satisfy this condition again because the metric is the identity, all right? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's right. I, just paused. I paused because I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to say next. Say it again. Oh, sorry, yeah, you're right. Sorry, you're, you're exactly right. In fact, yeah, you're exactly right. I have to complex conjugate. And so, yeah, thanks, Matt. I was, it's not on my game there. Okay. And since I'm in two dimensions, this defines a group we call U2. That's not the band. where the u means unitary. This is the unitary condition as opposed to the orthogonal condition that we had for real representations, okay? And again, we can go and ask this question. All right, is the unitary group continuous? And it turns out, no, it's not. For the same reason that the orthogonal group was not continuous. If you take the determinant, or yeah, if you, if, so I, I don't wanna want go play out the details again, but, but to get, a continuous group, we impose the specialness condition that the determinant of A equals plus 1, and then this leads us to SU2, the special unitary group in two dimensions. Okay. And again, the reason we need the specialness is to get rid of these sort of reflections along these complex axes and so forth and so on. Now, I, I, don't, I can't motivate that because of rotations, because you know, this isn't the rotation group, all right? but I want it to be a continuous group. To understand why we want it to be continuous, we're gonna not talk about until next week. But it turns out that for continuous groups, we have a particularly nice structure called a Lie structure, and it allows us a way to build up all the group elements from a few simple generators, a lot of details we'll talk about next week. But generally, we're, we're, we're typically trying to, buy, to build continuous groups. So in this case, we need to impose, again, the special condition. Um, okay, so in the last bit of time that we have, uh, what I want to do is a, a little bit of counting, a counting exercise. Um, because this is going to give us some interesting conclusions, uh, but it's also going to set us up for what we're going to talk about next Monday. So. Um, and, and again, the elements of SU2 here would be matrices that act on these complex vectors, so the matrices themselves are complex. Okay, if you're gonna throw a little complex in the story, you throw it in everywhere, okay? So what I wanna do now is, and there's gonna be quite a bit of writing in this, but um, 
it's kind of an interesting result. So what I want to do now is I want to count the free parameters in some groups. Okay, and we'll start with uh, um, SO3. So, okay, so if I start with an SO3 transformation, I know that if I take a, an R and I transpose it and hit another R, or hit, hit R, hit itself, I get the identity. And so, um, this tells me that if I write down an arbitrary matrix, If I take an arbitrary matrix and I transpose it and then multiply it by the original matrix, I better get the identity. Ostensibly, for a three by three matrix, there are how many numbers that determine it, Henry? How many numbers? Yeah. For a three by three matrix, how many things do you have to specify? Nine. Nine, yeah, good, three by three. <laughs> That's okay. Um, all right, but it turns out that this isn't just some arbitrary nine numbers, because if you just pick nine arbitrary numbers, they wouldn't do this. So what I want to do is figure out how many independent numbers can you pick, and then how many are determined by this relationship, okay? So unfortunately, to figure that out, we have to do this. We have to multiply this, okay? So I'm just gonna write down what you get, and I'm gonna write this very quickly. So what you do is, I'm going to write all the equations, but I just want to show you where they come from. You literally, again, this is, not, this is not anything you don't know, you literally transpose this and multiply it by this, and that will give you a three by three matrix. And then you take each element of that matrix and you match it up to an element here. Because this equation says a matrix is equal to a matrix. That means each element has to have a corresponding, okay? So I'm going to write down yeah. Here we go. So these are the equations you would get if you actually took the time, like I did, to multiply that out. I don't believe you. Shut up. <laughs> you go to hell, you go to hell and you die. By the way, I'm not actually looking at my paper. I'm doing all this matrix multiplication in my head. Because <laughs> I'm awesome. Okay. All right, that's nine equations. That's nine equations. All right. Check it out. Nine equations. Nine numbers. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Maybe there are no free parameters. Fortunately, if you stare long enough, you start to see that some of the equations are redundant. Where is it? There it is. That's good, because if we had genuinely gotten nine equations, then there would be no free parameters. You have nine numbers, nine equations, okay? But in the end, we actually have six equations, nine unknowns, which leave us with three free parameters. Okay? So there, there are, there's a freedom up to a certain degree, and that is the following. All I've done so far is I've written down the orthogonality relation. I haven't checked the determinant. Okay. So remember, we want to do SO3. So if I, I already know that if I take the determinant of R transpose R, that's the determinant of the identity, which is plus one. But I can break this up into the determinant of the product but the determinant of the transpose is the determinant of the original thing. So this becomes, I'll just write it out. So, you know, 
business and stuff. Okay. So the determinant of this is the determinant, the product of the determinants, but the determinant of the transpose to determine the original thing. So this is just the squared. If something squared is equal to plus one, then this is equal to plus or minus one. Okay. So what it means is when you pick your three parameters, the only thing you have to pay attention to is that the determinant is plus or minus one, but it's disconnected. You can't continuously change the determinant. Your numbers are either going to have minus one or plus one determinant. So for example, you know, the three parameters you might pick are zeros everywhere and the three numbers down the diagonal. So one choice could be that, but another choice could be that. They're the same numbers. You're just toying around with the signs to make sure you pick the one that's a plus one. Okay? So in the end, we legitimately have three parameters. Okay? Three free parameters to pick. If If we do this for an arbitrary SON, then we find one half n, n minus one free parameters. Okay? So you could do a couple of cases and convince yourself of this. Okay? So let's just catalog these. If, n, if I'm dealing with SO2, then I have how many free parameters? You plug two in where you see n. Yeah, you have one. If I do SO3, three. We just did that, remember? Okay. If, what is SO2? But physically, what does it correspond to? Rotations in two dimensions in a plane. Well, how many parameters do you have to specify to specify a rotation in a plane? The angle. You only have one. These are rotations in three dimensions. You can think of it, so one rotation angle. You can think of this as a rotation around x by some angle, a rotation around y by some other angle, and a rotation around z by a different angle. So you have three angles to pick. There are many different ways to parameterize rotations in intermediate mechanics. Hopefully you learned about those, like action or uh, Euler angles and things like that. So we don't have to go into the details of that. But generally, you've got three angles to specify, OK? However, how many do I have there? Six. Six. <laughs> Boosts. So um, our x, our y, our z, our w, if we add a fourth coordinate, because we're in four dimensions, but uh, just added the time. <laughs> okay, clearly, clearly this designation isn't working for us, because in this case, it doesn't work out. But it turns out there's a better way to talk about rotations. We often get this idea of rotate around the x-axis, but the way that we should really think about that is a rotation around the x-axis is a rotation in the yz plane. And a rotation around the y-axis is a rotation in the xz plane. And a rotation around z is a rotation in the xy plane. Now, we can figure out what these six things are. There are rotations in xy, rotations in yz, rotations in z, X, rotations in XW, rotations in YW, and rotations in ZW. Sure enough, six pairs. What? I'm just curious because from the matrix multiplication you get six equations, but then by specifying the determinant you add another equation, but you're not. No, finding. you don't. This is what I'm saying is this isn't an equation. You're automatically going to have the determinant of whatever you pick be plus or minus one. Okay. That's guaranteed. Yeah. So you can take all of your choices of parameters and dump them into two sets, those which have determinant plus one and those which have determinant minus one. There's not, a, there's not an equation you're solving. Oh, if you had okay. to, if, 
if you had to more carefully pick your parameters to make sure this was this, the determinant was plus or minus one, that would be an equation. But there, there, yeah, there are that observation is very important because it will be different in the complex case. Okay. Yes. But for an answer of three, don't we have to force the determinant to be one? This is what. So if you're in O3. What I just proved is that your determinant will automatically be plus or minus one. And yes, to be an SO3, you have to pick the plus one. But uh, what I'm saying is you're not going to have to choose your parameters according to an equation. They're just going to, they're naturally for any choice you make going to fall into one of two bins. And you just pick the ones with determinant plus one. I, 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 no, no more questions because I got something I got to say. Damn it! What is this? It's, it's, yes, it says so four. Physically, what is it? What is it? So, if you keep saying special orthogonal, you're reading. What physically is it? It is. It, it, is it. Is it special relativity? No. 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 Okay. It's not special relativity because this is rotations in four spatial dimensions. There's no time. So what I'm going to do in the last minute is show you what special relativity is. Okay. No. Special relativity, and we're gonna we're gonna. Shh, shh. I've only got four minutes before the bulldog comes in. Be quiet. Special relativity, and we're gonna talk a lot more about this in, in time. Uses shh, vectors which have four components. So that's my representation with a metric which is minus one, 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 one. This was the whole point of introducing this metric to show you how to build duals. In all the examples we've talked about so far, our metric was always the identity. But in special relativity, it is not. There's a negative sign there, and that changes things. We still use the condition that the transformations have to satisfy this, but now this looks different because this is not the identity. It's not, you can work it out, it's just a matrix. You can stick in the matrix there and you can do the whole story I just did, okay? And you're going to in your homework because I got where I wanted to get. <laughs> That's why I shut you up. Okay? <laughs> But if you do it, you will again find something similar to this, except this time you're going to find rotations in xy, rotations in yz, rotations in xz, and then the last set of three are better called rotations between spatial and time directions, and these are the boosts. These are spatial rotations. And together, these form the proper Lorentz group. Okay? We're going to talk a lot more about that next time. But just to give you, because you're going to need to know what this is in your homework, to name this group, we call it, if we impose the special condition to make sure it's continuous, we call it SO1, 3. Okay? It's not SO4, it's SO1, 3. This tells you there's a minus sign in the one spot. Right? You guys good? You can breathe now. Yeah. So, I know you're saying, say, like, uh, the time like dimension is just a negative. Well, I, I don't want to say that. I want to say that the metric is this. And yes, there's a different sign between spatial and timeline components of the metric. But I don't want to say that T is like negative compared to X, Y, and Z, because that's not what this is saying. Okay. All right, uh, I am going to add those two problems to your homework. But the two problems that I'm adding 
this and just correspond to doing that counting argument for a couple of uh, cases just to make sure you understand the details of it so it's nothing terrible all right you guys let's get out of here that guy is out there i'll meet you out the hall if you want to keep talking to me